Thank you so much, Dr. Joyce Jones, for blessing us with your anointed voice this morning. Let's give her another hand. Amen. Amen. Well, we're excited to, to be here this morning. We uh, certainly have been blessed by the worship experience uh, this morning. And now it's time for the Word of God. And uh, Pastor George has been taking us through this series uh, in the wilderness. And certainly many of us feel like we are in a wilderness situation. And uh, Pastor George has uh, uh, invited me to, to, to bring the closing sermon of this. So pray for me this morning. Amen. 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 But today we're looking at Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verses 23 to 31. And... When you think about Hebrews, it's really about perseverance. Uh, how do we get through what we're going through? What do we focus on when we're going through the wilderness? Who do we focus on when we're going through the wilderness? And certainly we have learned a lot through this series and we've learned about desert cardio, and that there's a cycle of grace and crisis and the word and faith and back to grace again. And today we will notice in Hebrews chapter 11, which we call Faith Hall of Fame, that all of those who came before us had to go through that cycle of grace, crisis, word, faith and back to grace again. So I would invite you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11 verses 23 to 31 and we're going to read this passage together so I ask that you stand. Hebrews chapter 11 verses 23 to 31. There you will find these words. By faith, Moses was hidden by his parents for three months after his birth because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called a son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to share ill treatment with the people of God than enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered abuse suffered for the Christ to be great in wealth and the treasures of Egypt. But he was looking ahead to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, unafraid of the king's anger. For he persevered as though he saw him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkling of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land. But when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. Amen. You may be seated. This is the word of God. Amen. The grass wither, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord lasts forever. A long obedience. The author of Hebrews is tracing the faithful steps of Moses and the faithfulness of God in his life. And as I began to read and meditate on this passage, I had a few questions that I had to ask of the writer of Hebrews. And that is, at what point did Moses begin to walk by faith? When did his journey of faith begin? 
until I took a closer look at this text and the preceding chapters and how they came to a crescendo in chapters 11 and 12, we get this beautiful and harmonious picture of Jesus as the author and perfecter of our faith. I had assumed for years that Moses began his faith journey when he ascended up to Mount Sinai and mesmerized by the sight of a burning bush that was not consumed by the fire. It was there that Moses heard the voice of God telling him to take his sandals off because he was standing on holy ground. It was there at Mount Sinai that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob called and commissioned Moses to go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let his people go. It was there that the sacred, that, that sacred spot that he was called to be the leader and lawgiver of the children of Israel. It was there where God patiently showcased to Moses who he was and what he was capable of doing. I would submit to you today that the story of Moses is one that points to the divine reality that God has his eyes on you before we ever set our gaze on him. The story of Moses is a case study in faith formation. In other words, it, faith formation it is, may be defined as that lifelong process by which God makes himself known to us through his grace, his word, and worship, and the wider community of faith whereby we move from secondhand faith to firsthand faith. In other words, we, we get to know God for ourselves. The writer of Hebrews restates the faith formation of Moses in very succinct terms, in pithy statements. God is in charge of your faith formation. He's in charge of my faith formation. Like Moses, you may fall and make some mistakes along the way, but you are never beyond the scope of God's grace. Now, there are three observations I want us to notice in this text as we learn what faith looks like. And as we look, as you read Hebrews chapter 11, you will discover that faith is not, there's not a definition that we can lay hold on faith, but there's a description, and he shows us what faith looks like. First thing I want us to notice is that when, when you live by faith, expect to be met with opposition. Expect to be met with opposition. Look, look at what it says here in verse 23 of chapter 11. By faith, Moses was hidden by his parents for three months after his birth, because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. The key word here is they saw that the child was beautiful. They saw that there was something different about Moses. They saw that there was an anointing on Moses even at his birth. F.F. F. Bruce points out the fact that the faith which was shown at Moses' birth was not his own, but his parents. And I love the name of Moses' parents, Amram and Yoshebed. You know, I don't think we've, we've named any of, any of our children after Amram and Yoshebed. <laughs> but it would certainly stand out. But it, it was their firsthand faith that they took the initiative to protect their child. That they took the initiative to, to hide him away for three months. And the writer of Hebrews tells us 
that it was by faith that they did this. Josephus points out, and we don't, we don't know whether this is true or not, but he, he points out the fact that Amram had a vision that Moses was something special and that he should be protected. This is what Josephus points out, but certainly the scripture tells us here in, in Hebrews that they took the initiative and they hid the child because they saw something special in him. Now, I want us to notice as we go through this section that there is a pattern that the writer of Hebrews wants us to follow. Some, some look at this passage as if this is a sermonic rhythm that uh, the writer of Hebrews, we don't know who he is, but the writer of Hebrews seems to have some sermonic rhetorical style that emphasizes the importance and the necessity of faith. So he constantly, constantly says, by faith. And this is referred to anaphora, which means repetition. And it, it, it has a, a progression to it. It mentions by faith, the person, the action, and the outcome. By faith, the person, the action, plus the outcome. And so we see this progression even in verse 23 that Amram and Yoshebed takes the initiative. They hide the child for three months and then when they could hide him no longer, somehow they got the idea to put him in a basket and, and allow him to float down the Nile right into the hands of Pharaoh's daughter. Now, that must have been a plan. That, that had to have, have been a plan. And, and, and somehow God was in the mix of that plan. So here's the thing, brothers and sisters, is that you're going to be, you're going to be met with opposition when you live a life of faith. There's, there's no way around it because when you live by faith, you're going uphill. <laughs> When you live by faith, uh, you're going against the grain of conventional society. When you live by faith, you're not going in the same direction as the enemy. That You may meet the enemy as you walk by faith. So we see this in Moses' parents' life that Moses' faith formation begins by the leadership of his parents, protecting him and guiding him. So when you live by faith, expect to be met with opposition. But not only that, when you live by faith, there is a radical abandonment from that which is temporary and an attachment to Christ. Look at verse 24 and 25. It, it, it says, by faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refusing to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to share ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered abuse suffered for the Christ to be greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to the reward. Here we see another movement in Moses' life, the statement when he was grown up. Uh, some scholars say that this, it, this implies that when Moses had become great, or some, some say that possibly Mo Moses is 40 years old at this time, we notice that throughout the Exodus story that there seems to be a progression of Moses' age as well from 40 to 80 to 125. Uh, there's no such thing as retirement in Moses' vocabulary. So we see Moses obviously knowing that he was a Hebrew. And it says when he was grown up, he refused, he had to make a decision 
to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He refused to be identified as Pharaoh's daughter. Moses had to make a choice. He had to take a risk of faith because that's, that, that's a major decision that he had to make. But here's the thing. True faith is, is characterized by a forward look and an openness to the divine pull of God into the future. In other words, faith always pushes us forward. Fear pushes us back. Faith always takes into consideration that the God that we serve has been to the future and back, and he knows what awaits us. So Moses must have been thinking and turning over in his mind that God has a plan for me. God has been to the future and back and knows the next chapter of my life and what it will look like. Moses is futuristic in his thinking. Moses understands that if I walk with God, then I'm going to have to disadvantage myself. I'm going to have to, as, as the, the writer of Philippians talks about Christ emptying himself, Moses in some sense had to empty himself of his Egyptian identity and come to grips with who he was in God. Brothers and sisters, I think Moses sets an example for us. He helps us to understand that our identity is rooted in God first, not in our ethnicity, not in, in our family, not in our careers, but our identity is rooted in God. And so Moses chose to radically abandon that from which he was, his upbringing. Is God asking us to do that? Well, I don't know. You have to be the judge of that. But I do know one thing. God wants us to be attached to Christ. He wants us to be in a dynamic relationship with Jesus Christ. And the writer of Hebrews uh, obviously brings Christ into the mix that somehow Moses was looking ahead and he could see Christ ahead. Moses was looking ahead and, and he chose to be identified with Christ and with the chosen people of God rather than with the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking ahead for his reward. It's the thing that... The, the life of faith is the, the only life that pleases God. When we walk by faith, we, we are saying, we're saying that, Lord, I trust what you see. I don't see it all, Lord, but I trust that your ways are higher than my ways and your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. I, I trust, Lord, what you see. Certainly in times like these when there's uncertainty and there's a lot of tension in the air, we have to trust what God sees. We, we have to trust that the fact that God is able to do exceedingly above and beyond all that we could ever ask or even think. The life of faith is the only life that pleases God. I think the songwriter said it best when he coined the words, there's no other way than to trust and obey. There's no other way. You see, living by faith is not an option in the Christian life. It's a necessity. It's the thing that distinguishes us from those who don't know the Lord. We're not called to live by sight. We're not called to say, Lord, I need to see it first before I walk this way. But we have to say, to ourselves, Lord, I, I trust what you see. And so, Lord, I'm going to follow your lead in this situation. Story reminds me of Harriet Tubman, who wanted to be free, and she escaped her master and 
and went up north. She, she wasn't satisfied with just being there by herself. But she took 13 more trips down south. And somehow she, she escaped uh, and hid from those who were looking for her. And she kept bring, bringing those who were enslaved up north because she believed that God was in the mix. That God was guiding her. That God was protecting her. And the story tells us that Harriet Tubman had blackouts. She would pass out. But somehow, in God's providential care, she was never discovered. And brothers and sisters, we, 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 we can live and, and tell that story about Harriet Tubman because by faith she did what she was able to do. She couldn't read, but she had courage, and she believed that God was with her. So there is this sense that we must make a radical abandonment from that which is temporary and attach ourselves to Christ. Next thing I want us to see here is that when you live by faith, there is a long obedience. There's a long obedience. Look at what it says in verse 27 and uh, 28. By faith, Moses left Egypt unafraid of the king's anger, for he persevered as though he saw him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. Think about this. Look at what Moses does. We see Moses' faith formation unfolding, moving from firsthand, secondhand faith, the firsthand faith. He knows God for himself now. And, and in his 40s, he makes this radical abandonment from that which is temporary and attaches himself to Christ, to God. And then we see Moses leaving Egypt, knowing that it would bring anger to the king, to the pharaoh. But the text said he persevered as though he saw him who is invisible. You see, faith isn't faith until we move on it. Faith and obedience go together. We've got to trust and obey God. We've got to persevere and continue to obey God. P faith, living by faith, is not a one-night stand. It, it, it's, it's a long obedience. I like the way Eugene Peterson said it in his, his classic book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. I encourage you to read, if you read it before, I encourage you to read it again because it speaks to our times. Discipleship in an, in an instant society. But he said this about perseverance. He says, perseverance is not the result of our determination. It is the result of God's faithfulness. We can be determined to persevere but it's because God has a greater, greater hold on us than we have on him. And, and, and sometimes God carries us when we can't carry ourselves. And even when we are faithless, even when we fall down, God says, I will carry you. And even in the Exodus story, it, it tells us that God carried the children of Israel on eagles' wings. He stirred up the nest and, and carried them on eagles' wings. And I love that statement. Eugene Peterson goes on to say that Christian discipleship is a process of paying more and more attention to God's righteousness and less and less attention to our own. That's where the long obedience comes in. You, as we mature in the faith, we don't pay less and less attention to God. 
we pay more and more attention to God. As we grow and, and, and grow in our maturity and faith begins to shape us and form us, we will discover that we become fixated on God, fixated on Jesus. Even when there are sideshows around us and distractions, we keep our eyes on the Savior. Pay more, more attention to him through his word. Pay more attention to him through worship. Worship is not about your preferences. It's about the preferences of God. Pay more attention to him through fellowship with one another because you have something that I desperately need and I have something that you desperately need and we're called to reflect the character of Jesus Christ. Pay more attention to him through his word. And the word of God it's preached and taught. We have to listen and study as if our very lives depend on it. Andrew Young, who was a colleague of Dr. King, he marched with King. And he was a former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. Urged a graduating class one day of the University of Maryland's Eastern Shore campus. He urged them, he says, get a Bible, read a chapter a day. It sounds like a merch, don't it? <laughs> it won't hurt you at all, he said, in his commencement address. And he says, and it will give you more illumination and purpose in life. And here's the thing I love you said. He says, it, it, it's better to invest $15 in a Bible now than $100 an hour for a psych psychiatrist later. <laughs> Amen, somebody. <laughs> what he's saying is that the, the Word of God counsels us, gives us wisdom, gives us insight. The, the Word of God gives us understanding that the world knows nothing about. So yes, Invest in $15. Read the Word of God daily, a daily intake of the Word of God. Last but not least, the, the life of faith enables us to overcome obstacles. The life of faith is the only life that pleases God. And we see this in verses 29 through 31, that by faith the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land. But when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. Brothers and sisters, God wants us to be a God pleaser. What God does when we seek to please him, he, he bookends our life with grace. Grace from the beginning and grace on the end. And what I would encourage you today, today, not to fake it till you make it, but to faith it till you make it. God wants us to walk by faith. We don't live a life of faith because we want to be popular. We live a life of faith because our greatest desire is to please him. Howard Thurman said that there's something in every one of us that waits and listens for the sound of the genuine in yourself. It is the only true God you will ever have. And if you cannot hear it, you will all of your life spend your days on the ends of strings that somebody else is pulling. Don't let anybody pull your strings but Jesus. You can trust him. You may not be able to see his hands, but you can trust his heart. Don't let anybody pull your strings but Jesus. Jesus died to pull your strings. He rose to pull your strings. 
Don't let anybody pull your strings but Jesus because he's the one who loves you. He's the one who looks after you. He's the one who keeps his eyes on you. He's the one that wakes you up in the morning. He's the one that clothes you in your right mind. Don't let anybody pull your strings but Jesus Christ. Yes, brothers and sisters, God wants us to live a life of faith and have a long obedience, a perseverance in the same direction. Is somebody else pulling your strings today? I want you to know today that Jesus said, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you, give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and, and learn from me, for my yoke is easy and my burdens are light. Yes, there's no other way than to trust and obey our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for worship. We thank you for the community of faith. We thank you, dear God, that you never give up on us. Thank you, Lord God, for the journey that you have us on, that by faith, dear God, we are being formed and shaped into the image of Jesus Christ. Whether we are at the beginning of our journey or in the middle of our journey or in the winter of our journey, dear God, there's still work for us to do just like you did with Moses, you do with us. Thank you, Lord, for this grace that we stand in. And Lord, we give you the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.